and I'm going to transform myself to a student again and uh, coming to Harry's group. And then I will chart this mystery behind MUCG 46. And uh, there are many of my other mentors are here. And uh, so first of all, I like to start with what my mom always told me, and then I'll go into the topic. So there is a saying in India, it's called Matha Pita Guru Devam. Uh, that means mom tells you who's your dad, and dad tells you who needs to be your teacher, that is guru. And guru shows the way towards the God. And uh, so with that, I give credit to Harry as my guru. And with that, I'm going to start what uh, mystery behind MUCG 46 and in my four years of my PhD and where I am right now, okay? So you can see in this picture, a lot of students are here. So that is a, one of the theme I'm going to use throughout this talk about how he played a big role in our students and how we play a big role in students in the future. Uh, I work closely between University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. That's the picture you see on the bottom there. Okay, with that, let me go to the first slide. So I know I have 40, 30 minutes to present and 15 minutes to Q&A. So I still remember Harry will just uh, time me clearly. And so I'm going to try to fix to 30 minutes of my talk. And what is my MUCG 46? And many of you may not know, uh, this is a BBC computer, which you get access as soon as you arrive at Oak Ridge. And if you ask Harry, you will talk about how you developed that MUCG 46. And then I'm going to talk about how that particular program played a role in explaining the microstructural transitions in steel, and also, how inspired us to track how carbon moves around in steel, and then also how external fields plays a role, and then where I am right now, how to go ahead and do site-specific microstructure. That's my agenda today. And then I'll close up with summary and future direction. That's, uh, with that, let's go to the first line. So around 1988, I arrived in Darwin College. Many of you might know this, and I believe I'm going to show this uh, over here. It's probably one of my room when I arrived there. And uh, so those walks to Darwin College, I still remember. And this is the annex building where I, we, both Roger and I, we all used to spend hours and hours in front of the theta dilatometer. And this is not those days taken picture, and this is, the picture you might have taken where every year we do that and you can see Harry there and somewhere in the background and sitting there. So now you must be wondering what is MUCG 46? I'm going to give the answer right away and then keep moving forward. So this is from Harry's notebook. Harry shared it with me day four yesterday and you can ask Harry to share this document with you if it is not already in the internet. So one of the things which caught my attention is in this document, he takes a picture from his notebook and then he talks about how he used his computer, this uh, HP computer with the Polish logic and how he programmed it. And then now you all can download it from MAP software, you can see that. And please read this document. In fact, it brought my whole memory flooding back when I started reading this MUCG document from Harry. So with that, let me go to the, from before I started. So what is MUCG 46? You can see this is a Fortran program snapshot of that. And you can see what is a typical input you need to give carbon, silicon, manganese, nickel, moly, chrome, vanadium. And then it goes through calculating uh, activity of carbon in austenite. So that is why it's called mu CG. Mu is for chemical potential, C is for carbon, and G is for austenite, and that is where it all started. And you can see in the document Harry shared with me, he walks through why that is important to write the code by himself, because that allows us to understand what goes into behind the box. Now we all use a lot of software like Thermocal, Pandat, empty data. So, but understanding the background behind it is very important. And in fact, as soon as we arrive, Harry always told, go dig deeper and go to the reading the papers and everything related to the MUCG 46. And you all know why we need to do this is to calculate this driving force for ferrite to come out of the austenite. And that triggered the whole calculation of TTT diagrams. And you all know this is rest is history. The most important thing here is the paroequilibrium 
activity of carbon. And this allows us to figure out what is the role of substitution elements, even though they may not move and it can have an effect on the carbon activity. So this allowed us to get into designing steels and consumables. So let me get, take you all back to first meeting in 1988. And I arrived at Harry's office. Harry takes me to the store and says that you, you shall always use your notebook. And you can see this is my first year notebook. Many of you know what this, all these things is our polishing to create TEM foils. And uh, so you can see it leaves a mark on your notebook also. And I still hold on to this notebook. And this is the first page when Harry writes this uh, question, which I need to address as a part of my PhD. I still remember, you can see it's Harry's handwriting there. And then I go back and start reading the TTT diagram. And you can see how the reading papers is very important and digging deeper is very important. So we all still remember our coffee times where Harry will have this uh, Cambridge pocketbook and then we will draw, draw back of the envelope many times the discussion. I still cherish them too. And still I hope it happens right now too, all those digging deeper questions. But that, so let me go to the next uh, one. So once you know how to describe the activity of carbon in austenite and carbon activity in ferrite, as a function of temperature, stress, or field, this is what defines our mini alpha research even now. And you may know this nice diagram from Bay Nighting Steel's handbook. I still remember Harry developing this with the Macintosh computer. And I believe he used Cricket Graph or so to create this nice plot and clearly establishes how we need to go about looking at steel phase transformations also. So each and every box here has hundreds and hundreds of papers be behind that. And we all have to read and we need to have a critical discussions about it. So this defined us to explain few questions. So I'm going to go with that. So let's explore a few questions. So I'm going to start with my PhD questions. I still remember this diagram etched in my mind. And even sometimes I still remember in my dreams. So Harry showed this graph and then he showed Suresh. As you increase the chromium content in steels, and you see this peculiar transformation, initially a cyclic ferrite fraction increases, and he called it million dollar microstructure because there's a lot of people worked on it to create a cyclic ferrite. And then above a particular chromium concentration, it seems to be decreasing. So answer this question. So that's the first question. So what we went through, uh, quite a lot of Harry guided me through to figure out what could be happening. Initially, we thought it could be because of inclusions may be changing in steel. And so, but however, what really uh, figured out is uh, one, um, I think probably late evening discussions with Harry while he was in Oak Ridge National Laboratory emails going back and forth. What we noticed is that even though those steels produced Benedict microstructure at certain conditions, it triggered back a cyclic ferrite. That shows that inclusions are the same. And what we figured out is this grain boundary electromorphic ferrite, which forms here along the prior austenite grain boundary, kind of kills all the grain boundary nucleation sites so that the bainite doesn't form. In addition to that, Harry's uh, MMUCG 46 allowed us to figure out, hey, there should be a carbon activity is decreased. So that means it's stabilizing the austenite. And that is another reason too. And this was, I believe, probably I ecstatic on those emails going back and forth when Harry's uh, we're embarking on explaining this transition also. And so what it really points out is that, well, is it only relevant to iron chrome carbon or will we see it in other steel welding consumables? Now, what you could do is you can take MUCG 46 and then make it as a black box and then couple it with the optimization algorithm. And I'm going to show you that. So here, this is the mechanism, uh, Harry's nice graphic here. You can see this grain boundary ferrite forms kills all the sites for formation of bainite. Now, what you could do is you can connect MUCG 46 to optimization algorithm. Of course, I didn't do that when during my PhD days because we had to do even for one calculation used to take a lot of time. Now you can do this in your computers and you can see that 
for wide range of carbon, silicon, manganese, nickel, moly, and chrome, you may arrive at similar transitions where the electromorphic ferrite will go away and you may uh, kickstart the mainite also. That clearly showed that how the substitutional alloying elements makes a big difference to carbon activity and also how different cooling rates in the weld may lead to totally different microstructure. That was the most revealing and when I uh, was going through the thesis also. So the question comes, comes about it, is there any other variables we can use to kind of move from different variants of bainite forming? Can we move, move from a very basket weave structure to very aligned acyclic product? Is there any other variables we can do also? Again, this question came about in a coffee time also. And that led to this uh, work where we got a new machine from Japan. It's a Fuji thermomechanical simulator. So the first experiments Harry and I we did is to put the sample under compressive stress and then uh, allow the transformation to occur. And then we, what we noticed is that there is no stress. All kinds of variants are promoted. Whereas when you put an elastic stress, only few variants are promoted. And that clearly showed the mechanism of acicular ferrite and bainite are the same. And it also showed transmission induced plasticity. You can see here the strain in y axis and then x is the time. If there is no stress, it goes that way in both the direction, both the diameter and length. But when the case of when you put a stress, you get a difference in the diameter and the length. This showed that the transformation induced plasticity was that. So what did we learn during that is local changes in carbon activity in steel was very important. So that means you can't forget about the local changes. And then you can also get similar activity of carbon by modifying substitutional and interstitial elements. In addition to that, also composition temperature, you can use stress, the elastic stress also. So this clearly provided a direction for, at least from my perspective, that the global and local boundary conditions have to be considered in unison. You can't ignore them. You will see the train of thought as we move forward. With that, let me go to the next one. So uh, this led to many, many discussions in conferences. Harry always asked, OK, can you track the carbon activity spatially and temporally? And in the right, the diagram over here, you can see the carbon uh, concentration profile collapsing at the different temperatures. You can simulate them with many of the software you all have access. And this is the para equilibrium phase diagram. You all must have started off when you're doing PhD in Bainite and you're talking about T0 and XT0 calculations also. And we always compare them. So what is the austenite concentration and ferrite concentration? So I'm not going to spend too much time on how the Adam probe was very influential. And this is where I give credit to Matthew Peet and Matthew uh, traveled to Oak Ridge to work with on the super bayonet. And you're going to hear about super bayonet. I'm not going to talk more about it. But what we figured out is doing during Adam probe is that carbon concentration in austenite and ferrite and which we compared it to all the para-equilibrium phase diagrams we also noticed that carbon is super saturated in ferrite, uh, but not as much as the, the bulk concentration. And that clearly showed some of the classic work done by other students of uh, Harry, where they showed the partitioning of carbon to austenite after the transformation event too. And this clearly showed that, okay, we need to track where the carbon goes. And uh, again, since other students are going to talk about it, I'm just going to briefly provide how we can measure how the carbon moves indirectly by using that uh, synchrotron time resolved X-ray diffraction experiment. This is where I give credit to my collaborator, John Elmer, who pulled me into this area. He showed that when you take a synchrotron power um, photon source and you can actually do in-situ diffraction even during welding at a very, very fast time resolution. This clearly opened up a totally new area to see how the steels are undergoing phase transmission, even from the liquid condition. And again, carbon activity always shows up here. 
And I'm going to show in this case, we are working on iron, aluminum, carbon, and manganese steel wells. It's called shell shielded flex core arc wells. I give credit to Dr. Nari Quintana who introduced this to the system. And what we did in this case is that we are welding and cooling, and then we are looking at what happens in the heat affected zone and in the solidification region. And you can see here, this is from the well metal. You have a liquid here, and then liquid transforms to gamma, and then gamma transforms to the ferrite microstructures at low temperature. In the heat affected zone, you have a ferrite, transforms to gamma partially, and then transforms back into the ferrite. And these kind of in-situ information is very, very helpful also. And again, nowadays you can do it readily in beam lines across the board. What did we learn is tracking carbon is possible that directly using atom probe or indirectly using synchrotron tools. But however, what we also realized is we need combination of tools, not only synchrotron tool, we may have to use optical microscopy along with that. And this is actually a lot of research is happening in this area. But while doing that, we cannot ignore is the hidden mass transfer and solidification because solidification sets the stage for solid state phase transformation too. So this takes me to the third question. Can we manipulate the carbon activity with external uh, fields? And indeed it is quite possible. And this is not the first time people have looked into it. There are a lot of classic work and by the way, all of them points back to one of the paper we all have to read as a student is impact of magnetism upon metallurgy. So I still remember Harry said, go read this to understand T10, T20 in MUCG46. And with that, let me go to the, the work which we did. In this case, I give credit to Roger Armillo. He was a researcher in Oak Ridge National Laboratory and we got the super bainite and two different concentrations. We transformed them under continuous cooling conditions with the 30 Tesla. And when I saw this microstructure over here with the 30 Tesla, I didn't know what it was. So I still remember having a very uh, worriedly asking Harry over the phone, Harry, what is this? And Harry said, this is like a fine perlite. Go dig deeper into it. Go put it in TEM, you'll see what it is. And in fact, and you can see that you, this super bennet is not supposed to transform to perlite under normal continuous cooling conditions. Indeed, when you go into transmission electron microscopy and you can see fine perlite, what is so surprising is that even though we are cooling at one degree centigrade per second, the alloying elements actually partition between cementite and also the ferrite while going through transformation. If you remember original classic paper of Harry, where he looked at the perlitic microstructure and substitution as redistribution using as a time temperature recorder for the steels. And it clearly shows that this is very important to understand even the substitutional motions during politic transformation. Now you may under, wonder why do we care? But with and without magnetic field, now we can manipulate soft and hard microstructures. But there are still unanswered questions. So how does the magnetic field play a role on diffusivity? We didn't expect the substitutions to move so fast. And this is still an answered question from my perspective. Probably somebody might have answered. I look forward to having more discussions on that also. What it clearly shows is another area which you can use is external fields to manipulate the microstructure. So what did we lessons learned is it is really exciting if you are going to be changing the carbon activity in steels. You can change composition, put different temperatures, put different stress constraints, use fields. So uh, we have not explored all combination. So this leads to my, what is the next question, which we need to go. I put a question mark there. So one of the things which we always do is when you are manipulating this composition, we always let the nature take its course and move the things and then get the geometry, whatever the nature dis dictates. But can we think differently? So in this case, I give credit to one of my students who uh, walked into my class when I was doing additive manufacturing. One of the things about additive manufacturing, we can manipulate the materials exactly in a locations. And I was talking about it in my class, and then he showed a video 
a paper wasp, which is there in South in uh, America here in Tennessee also. It builds its nest and you will see here, this is where it co connects to uh, some substrate and then it builds like a cantilever or so. And then this is where it puts its eggs and offsprings come out. And you will notice that the design changes every time. They don't keep the same design. They use local materials and they actually sense it and then manipulate the materials and using local materials. And of course, these are all wood uh, material and then builds the whole nest. So the question for us is, can we mimic what nature does it? The nature is so beautiful. In fact, when they build, they always build from top to bottom. The reason why they do top to bottom is they do not want a buckling load conditions also. This is again, one of my students taught me too. And clearly shows that nature had figured out a way to do work with the different heterogeneous materials and still get what the properties they want. And they pass on the knowledge from one generation to another generation. Can we really do that? So in fact, we have been uh, exposed to similar situations in steels. For example, if you had a, a lot of chemical segregation, you get totally different properties. And this is again goes back to some of the classic work Dr. Khan did with Professor Badisha on related to compositional gradients and how the microstructure evolves, how do you predict them? But what uh, Gary Kola showed in his work is that when you have these kind of, uh, I would call it, it's like an oxymoron, homogeneously heterogeneous materials, and you can get phenomenal properties there also. So now this again came about because he set it up the concentration gradients during steel making. So how can we get similar in a controlled way? So there are evidences where additive manufacturing can provide a way to go forward. And this is a work done by my uh, colleague here, Alex Plutkowski. So in this case, what uh, Alex is doing is trying to write a monolysis image in crystallographically. So the way he manipulated the crystal texture is by changing thermal gradient and liquid solid interface velocity by moving electron beam rapidly around and many, making sure that we can have either one growth or having misoriented growth. And we were not pretty uh, good in reproducing Mona Lisa, but you can see that you can create highly textured, uh, which is mimicking that. It's an experimental data you see on the right-hand side also, electron backscatter diffraction imaging. But the reason why we could get there is we understood fundamental theories developed by Professor Kurz and Trivedi and all those people who have put down the foundational theories so we can take the theories and manipulate to create those 3D structures too. Can we do that for steels? So there are evidences. You can use some of the techniques like binder jet additive manufacturing. In this case, uh, uh, Asaf came from Ben Gurion University, worked with uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory to show that you can create a skeleton of titanium carbide scaffolding and then allow the steels to infiltrate by liquid and then you do the heat treatment and then you can manipulate the localized carbon activities and then produce martensite and then get the properties you want. So the binder jet is a one way to do it also. So uh, what else you can do? So then I'm going to go to the next slide. And this is where I give credit to one of my students, Mian Sridharan, so what he said is that, why don't we use a direct energy deposition process where we have a flexibility of using different powders of steels, and then we can actually, in different regions, we can change the compositions. So we went down the pathway of manipulating stacking fold energy so that you can produce austenite, which is unstable under loading conditions, it can transform to either epsilon or modern static transformation and produce a la carte properties too. And this is again goes back to some of the discussions in the coffee room where Professor Alan Cottrell showed that work long, long time back before we even came around. So I have around two minutes to go. So that is 8.30 is coming up. So I like to close with this a little bit more. What the summary of this journey, the steel global journey as a student uh, working with Harry is that we can manipulate carbon activity in steels. 
and that's a good thing. And still many combinations have to be uh, taken care. And also we may have to learn to live with uh, diversity that is heterogeneous microstructure and brought about by solidification and solid state transformations. Some areas we actually that may work to our advantage rather than having a homogeneous materials within the component also. So the future is very, very uh, fresh for us to get into using local materials. Not all of them have to be highly refined materials. We can use energy efficient process to create 3D components and we can manipulate the global and local boundary conditions to get the microstructure what we want. And that leads to my last slide. And the reason why we're all doing this remotely is because we tried uh, to see whether we can have a in-person meeting. I, I still remember Harry told that uh, Suresh, you know, by doing this uh, remote, we can reduce our emissions, CO2 emissions and everything. We don't need to travel all of them. So that leads to future directions. So one of the classic paper, which you can download right now, shows that our uh, global emissions, if you look at the industry wise, iron and steel is still very high. So one of the things which we can take it forward from moving forward from this day forward, we can tell our mentor, our colleagues and researchers, and is there any other way we can create high strength skills or properties which we cannot get where we right now we have into a components by reducing the emissions and still get the high strength steels or high performance steels with functional and structural properties. And that could be used as our roadmap. And uh, this is a time I like to take time to, this is a picture I took probably in 2004 in the old building. And you can see the old MacBook or uh, power book there. And Harry was, scanning all those uh, papers in his folders there, and then telling me that make sure that dig deeper also. So with that. Thank you very much for such an interesting talk. Many different uh, topics were covered, all of them very, very interesting. Uh, so now we, we go into a 15 minute um, phase for questions. So if you have any questions, please type them in, in the chat or raise your hands and we can unmute you and then you can ask directly. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, for example, a little bit about the additive manufacturing and how you can tailor the properties of, uh, of local regions. Do you think this would lead to, or have you been able to produce parts in which you, for example, get rid of surface heat treatments like nitriding by using this technology? Okay, so um, it's a good question. Surface nitrating is very relevant for tool making, uh, but that is, uh, so one of the things which you have to remember is that if you're making tools, the surface finish has to be very good. So that means we need to make sure that if you are doing graded chemistry, make sure that you don't make very hard chemistry near the surface, the machining becomes a real issue. So sometimes I will also tell you that additive manufacturing is not a panacea for everything. So you need to work with the traditional nitriding, which is well established, and you can combine both of them to, fit, to get the tools which you want also. So think uh, what performance you need and then walk back and pick up the processes which you need. And that's my uh, uh, the thought process on it. Oh, very interesting. And what is the resolution uh, for changing the properties, for example? So yes, beautiful. So if you're asking for local property gradients, which locally, how much resolution, spatial resolutions we can do, you can see in the Mona Lisa images, the resolution is dictated by the spot size of the electron beam mass. So these are in the order of 200 micrometer or so. And the reason why we can achieve that is because within 200 micrometer, we can access the wide range of thermal gradient and liquid solid interface velocity. But below that, it's very difficult to do it. Perfect, thank you very much. So we have a question now from Indrajit Day. Could you please unmute him? So he, so they ask the question. Hello, so myself Indrajit Day. I'm calling you from India. Uh, okay. I, okay, so basically you have shown a slide where parallelic microstructures were there and you show the elemental distributions. So uh, in case of parlite, uh, as it is known to me that uh, carbon is the main element which uh, diffuses from cementite to ferrite. So uh, uh, 
other elemental distributions you have also shown. Can you please explain those uh, elemental distributions? Okay, sure. Uh, I think I'll go to my sharing and then so that I went probably a little faster. So I make sure that I explain that clearly also. And what we are seeing here is a fine pearl in the super Benedict keel, which had a chromium and also silicon and other ele alloying elements too. And uh, this was continuously cooled from high temperature. This is not isothermal perlite under a high magnetic field, 30 Tesla. And uh, this is an atom probe data and you can go across. And what we notice is the chromium is actually partitioning to cementite and silicon is also partitioning away from the cementite, which is expected for cementite. But this is, remember, this is uh, a special heat treatment with the 30, 30 Tesla. If you do not put the 30 Tesla in this field, you never get perlite for these cooling conditions. But over, if you go back to Harry's classic paper on uh, also some other students working on uh, steels which go since power plants, these cementites actually form M3C. That means there is no partitioning and then the cementite over a period of time while running in the surveys actually enrich aligning elements because that's what expected. Cementite is very isomorphous. The manganese goes into uh, cementite, chromium goes into that before kickstarting other carbides so, so you can actually see them also. So uh, to be specific, this is a special heat treatment with high magnetic field. That is why we are seeing the partition. I hope I explained it. So any other follow-up, please? And Harry is here, he can correct can me. make a, a comment, Suresh, yeah? Yeah. So um, the cementite in perlite, uh, we always see partitioning, but it's uh, not equilibrium partitioning, That's it's not para-equilibrium, whereas the cementite which we use for a time temperature recorder is that which forms from bainite or martensite, where you don't actually get partitioning because the mechanism by which it forms is, is displacive. That's great. Well, just to follow up a little bit on this, on this cementite. Okay. Did you ever look into altering the magnetic field to, for example, reduce the intermolar spacing or, or play with precipitating phases in the ferrite? No, we no, only not. had a 30 Tesla. We uh, in that experiment, we have not manipulated the magnetic levels different ones. And I do not know whether anyone else has performed the similar experiments with the super bainite. And Francisca is here, probably may be able to comment on it if there's anybody else played with uh, less magnetic field on this particular screen. Hello, all together. Hello, Harry. Hello, Suresh. Um, so, one question. Um, so, um, um, you are known to make uh, many investigations, for instance, at the probe, not only 3D, also 1D in the past. And I remember a discussion many, many years ago on silicon and cementite. That's great. We were discussing on, um, so what, um, or can it go in or not? And with the classical view, it is uh, to see not to go. And so now 25 years later, we have so much knowledge on, I would say the details with the precipitates, with partitioning, non-partitioning, para-equilibrium. Um, and so I'm coming from the steel industry. Um, so uh, today we are uh, very much looking forward to making simulation, prediction. Um, how would you say is all this very precious knowledge which you created, Harry, et cetera, can uh, now be used in our simulation tools? The answer is, of course, yes. Uh, and we have quite a lot of data out there and always the simulation tools can be uh, calibrated or fine-tuned to predict that. And in fact, silicon and cementite, it was already predicted before I even did that by Adam Bro by Harry also, and it's quite possible to have that. And we, we were to able to do it during tempering, early stage tempering also. And it's well known, not even before I did, that silicon has a huge effect on tempering resistance too. So in a way, what we have done in the Adam probe is to show how it could happen also. But going back to how we can predict at what stages and when, how it is uh, one, I believe you can um, force it in Dictra or other diffusion softwares to 
have super saturation, allow them to get out also. And I haven't done recently, so I may be very rusty in that. So there may be other people who can comment on it. Professor, but uh, so I can read out if you're okay as the organizer, so I can uh, read and answer if you're okay. Uh, the Professor uh, Fani Kumar is saying, Professor Badisha pioneered open source movement in metallurgical engineering domain. How far are we today from the directions showed us with respect to simulation codes being made open, particularly in the advent of HPC getting more useful? I think it is, uh, Harry was very pioneering in that uh, developing he, I still remember, hey, look, Suresh, we have a numerical algorithms group. We should have a materials algorithms group, MAP. That started MAP. And right now there is a lot of open sources. Uh, GitHub is where you can find many of the um, people who are working in computer science, all those things. They actually, you put that in the GitHub as an open domain and use that as they're showing that they're contributing to community. And we, sh we should continue to do that in uh, so that the overall global community, and at least in skills, we can continue to uh, move forward. And that's my comment on for Fani. Uh, 